Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I serve Warzone Tours as an Army Attack Helicopter Pilot and CIA Officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we take a historical look at the Battle of Actium, a huge naval battle off the coast of Greece that determined the future of what we now know as the Roman Empire. We welcome Cornell University's Professor Barry Strauss back to the podcast to bring another epic battle to life. Listeners will remember him from our deep dive into the life of the well-known Spartan warrior, Brasidas. This particular battle at Actium and the lead up to it involves some of the iconic names we've all heard from history, like Cleopatra, Mark Anthony, Octavian Caesar, and Julius Caesar. We also learn about Rome's most decorated naval commander, Admiral Agrippa, and how he defeats a numerically superior force at sea. Barry's newest book, The War That Made the Roman Empire, brings this battle and the personalities to life. Those who appreciate our combat stories will enjoy hearing how battles were fought on the open sea at this time, and some of the tactics that each side had to use. While some of those tactics have changed, the overarching military, political, and diplomatic strategies have not, to include the use of information warfare. And you'll see several similarities to what's going on in Ukraine today. I hope you enjoyed this combat story from history as much as I did. Barry, thanks for coming back and sharing yet another uh, interesting historical story with us today. Ryan, thanks for having me back. It's great to be here. So we're going to dive in to uh, what the, the book that is coming out here soon, The War That Made the Roman Empire, Anthony, Cleopatra, and Octavian, uh, Octavian at Actium. And just so folks can get a look at it, um, this is your, your latest publication that's coming out. And we're going to dig into what is a fascinating battle, not just a huge naval battle, but the information operations that lead up to it the huge personalities that are, are involved, the statecraft, the espionage, um, everything. And I think we'll have some parallels to what people are seeing in Ukraine and Russia, which is going off right now. For those who watch this in the future, we're at the beginning of what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. So I would just say, Barry, since you were here um, previously, some of the listeners will know you. Mm -hmm. We did an intro for you, obviously, as we kicked off. But if possible, could you share just a little bit more about where you're working and how this book came to be for you as it's one of many publications of yours before we dig in. Thank you. So I, I'm at Cornell University where I'm a professor of history and classics. I'm also a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution in, uh, in California. And when I wrote this book, I had the good fortune of being a, a distinguished visiting professor at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. And I got to work with a, a lot of the professionals there and they're very helpful in my understanding of what was going on. Uh, I've been interested in Actium pretty much all my career. When I was a graduate student, I had the chance to study in Greece and I was present at the creation. I visited the site of the battle with two young scholars who are going to devote their career to the archaeology uh, of the place. Uh, after the battle, uh, the future Emperor Augustus turned it into a memorial, kind of a theme park to his victory. And uh, it's only been excavated completely in, in recent years by, by, by two of my fellow students uh, when, when I was a graduate student there. So uh, I've been inspired by them and by this place for many, many years. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the prologue of this book it kind of yeah. talks about this bronze statue or I'm not sure what it was made out of but kind of overlooking where this epic battle took place yeah it's a a, a marble uh, a huge complex made of marble and they had the bronze rams that were taken as trophies from Antony's ships uh, and were put up as, as part of this victory monument overlooking uh, the side of the battle on a hill high above the side very dramatic great all right so as we as we dig in here I think much like my, myself, I think a lot of people will see it's, they just don't have um, a clear understanding of this time in history. So sure. if you could set the stage for kind of what time period we're in, we're about to talk about the Roman empire and, you know, obviously that spanned a considerable amount of time. So where are we at in that evolution and what part of the world are we talking about? Um, because it's broader than just Rome. Right. 
So um, the Battle of Actium is part of a war over who's going to run the Roman Empire uh, and whether the empire is going to look westward or look eastward. And there are really two main, two men who are really fighting over the empire at this time. Uh, one is a man named, uh, born, named Gaius Octavius when he's born. He's later on adopted by his great uncle, Julius Caesar. He calls himself Julius Caesar, but historians refer to him as Octavian in this period. His uh, rival is a man named Mark Antony. Marcus Antonius would be his Latin name, but we know him as Mark Antony from Shakespeare. Uh, and um, just as Gaius Octavius was Caesar's great nephew, Antony was one of Caesar's lieutenants in his battles. And the two of them really fought over the mantle of who would be Caesar's, Caesar's heir. Um, they had divided the empire up uh, years earlier between the two of them, uh, and it had a very rocky relationship. And it finally came down to an out and out war uh, it, that was decided, uh, decided at Actium. Actium is located in the Northwest coast of Greece. Uh, for people who know Greece, if you've been to Corfu, that beautiful island, Actium's on the mainland, not far away from Corfu. It's a little bit off the beaten track of, of, of tourism. Uh, it is located at the entrance to a very uh, uh, very useful bay, the Gulf of Am Ambracia. It's a good place to put your ships. Uh, that's why Antony had so much of his fleet there. Uh, and um, it's kind of in the dividing point between the Eastern Empire and the Western Empire. Uh, Octavian's uh, home base was Rome in Italy in the West. Antony's home base at this period was Alexandria, Egypt. Why Alexandria, Egypt? Because Antony's main ally and also his lover was Cleopatra, uh, the queen of Egypt, one of the great legendary figures of antiquity. Uh, we might think of her from Hollywood uh, as a sex object, and she certainly did use her charms. But she was a great queen like Elizabeth I of England or Catherine the Great of Russia. Uh, she was a very successful administrator great strategist, highly intelligent woman, uh, and had uh, been very successful in rebuilding the kingdom of Egypt that uh, she had inherited. Her family, the Ptolemies, had been ruling Egypt for about 300 years. The founder of the dynasty was a general of Alexander the Great. Um, and uh, she was that rare thing, a, uh, a queen who ruled alone. Uh, she had, early in her career, her first lover had been Julius Caesar, with whom she had an affair, and by whom she claimed to have a son. Caesar didn't recognize the child, but he allowed her to give him give the boy his name, which is tantamount to recognizing him. Uh, everyone called the boy Caesarian. He was going to be the heir to the throne. She also had three children, two boys and a girl, by Mark Antony, so she had four four children. She, so she had the, these two great Roman uh, men were her two, the two, her two lovers in, her, in a row. She, she chose two of the most powerful men in the world. So um, she was quite the politician. How, a couple questions there. So I think first, just for her at the time, Alexandria, was that a matriarchal society? Was it unusual for a woman to take that type of role? It was very unusual for a woman to take that kind of role. It wasn't a matriarchal society. There had been powerful queens in Egypt before uh, under the Ptolemies, but you'd have to go back th uh, thousands of years to the Pharaonic age to find a queen who ruled alone and had this kind of power. A Hatshepsut would be an example, but no Ptolemaic queen had had the kind of power that Cleopatra had had. Cleopatra wow. had. And again, times time here, we're talking like 30 BC. Right. There. So the bat, yeah, Actium itself took place on September 2nd, 31 BC. Okay. And it's about 10 years after the death of Julius Caesar. Is that right? That's right. He's assassinated on March 15th, 44 BC. So about 13 years. Okay, perfect. And then the next question, since we were talking about Cleopatra, and you mentioned that's kind of the eastern side of like, right. what is the Roman Empire, how far right. east does it go? Like, how, what are we looking at for the span of the Roman Empire at that time? So, on the eastern borders of the empire uh, would be it stretched as 
far east is what is now Eastern Turkey. Uh, it included all of the Levant, so Syria, Israel, Palestine, Jordan. Uh, I wait, actually, sh I should take that back because um, uh, at that point, Judea was a, a, um, a client kingdom of the empire. It was independent, uh, but it was an ally of the Romans. And there were several other client kingdoms in, in that area. I'm looking ahead of myself when they became mm -hmm. provinces. Uh, that would be the eastern edge of the empire. And Egypt as well was an independent kingdom, but allied with the Romans. And then to the west, how far are we talking into Europe? Uh, as it west uh, all the way to uh, to Gaul, so what is now France and Belgium, wow. they were a part of the empire. Um, and um, yeah, that's as far as it went. Caesar had Caesar had invaded Britain twice, but he hadn't conquered it. Okay, so I think it's important in. It, in the lead up to this to really dig into a couple of the personalities here. Right. So we mentioned Cleopatra. If you can spend just a bit of time on Mark Anthony and sure. Octavian, and yeah. then I think we'll move to this Admiral Agrippa who we'll yes. introduce here in a moment. Yeah. But I think the big names that you have on the front of the book are there yeah. for a reason. If you can share yeah. a little more context sure. on them. So uh, Mark Anthony was a Roman. He came from a noble family. So Rome was a and a, a society dominated by a narrow elite uh, of people, a hereditary elite. And the Antonii, Antony's family, were a, in that elite. Um, but they hadn't really had a great leader for a long time. Uh, Antony's father and his grandfather were kind of also rams. Uh, Antony himself was a distant relative of Julius Caesar, and he fought for Caesar in Gaul. Uh, and again, in the civil war that followed when Caesar uh, became conqueror of the Roman Republic. Um, Antony was a very good second in command. Um, he wasn't as good as, a, uh, as, as the number one. Um, some of he, he played a very important role for Caesar at the battle in Greece in which Caesar defeated Pompey. But it's kind of disturbing about Antony that his greatest uh, his finest hours come in retreats. First from a retreat when he was defeated in a siege and a civil war at, outside a city in northern Italy. Uh, he led his men to safety across the Alps and Gaul and then bounced back. Uh, and again, in a retreat um, from, uh, he attempted to conquer what is now northwestern Iran. And he failed and he led his men in a very harrowing retreat back to the Mediterranean coast. He saved most of his army, but he had pretty substantial losses, maybe as much as 25% of his uh, troops were lost, which is pretty major, as you know. His greatest success had been at the Battle of Philippi uh, in 42 BC against Brutus and Cassius and Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. And that was indeed a battlefield victory, but it's one that Antony won uh, as much because of the mistakes that his enemies made as on the part of his own successes. So uh, he was also a very good diplomat and uh, did an excellent job of uh, arranging a series of settlements in the East, setting up client states to serve as buffers between Rome and its one great last rival, the Parthian Empire, an ancient Iranian empire uh, that faced Rome across the Euphrates in this point in history. Um, Antony did an excellent job of his diplomatic settlement there. Okay, great. It's, and is he similar age to Octavian at this time? No, he's, 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 he's quite a bit older than Octavian. He's about 20 years older than okay. Octavian. Uh, he is, uh, you know, he's at the height of his powers uh, around 50 uh, at this time. Octavian's a much younger man. Uh, only in his early 30s. Also, it should be said that Antony was, um, he was a big guy. Um, he loved fighting. Uh, he was a soldier's soldier. He was one of the guys. He hung out with his troops. Um, he was uh, kind of attractive physically. Uh, um, he was a certain type, very charismatic and a very good speaker. Octavian's a different story. So first of all, Octavian's younger. When Caesar's assassinated, Octavian's only 18. And a lot of people write him off as a kid. He's just a kid. 
but he is precocious. Uh, there are a number of examples of precocious uh, people in the ancient world, um, and partly because lifespans were shorter and people grew up faster than they they do today. Uh, he's at the extreme end of, of youthful talent. One of the reasons why Caesar chose him as his heir is he had spent some time with Caesar on campaign and Caesar's last campaign in the Civil War. And Caesar saw just how talented Octavian was. So Octavian wasn't a great soldier. He wasn't a coward. He fought in battle. He was wounded. But he's just not the kind of field commander that Antony was. And he doesn't uh, enjoy fighting the way that Antony does. But what Octavian is, is a brilliant strategist um, and a, a magnificent politician. Uh, he knows how to manipulate people. He is a Machiavellian before Machiavelli. He also has a killer instinct, second to none. Uh, this is a guy with an ambition in the stratosphere. After Caesar dies, a few months after Caesar dies, and just after he's turned 19, Octavian gives a speech in Rome. He's standing in front of a statue of uh, the martyred Caesar, and he says, I will not stop until I have all the honors that my uh, adoptive father, Julius Caesar, had. Uh, so here's this 19-year-old saying, basically, I want to run the Roman Empire. Um, and in, in the end, of course, he succeeds. And uh, since, since we have this 10-year window between when he passes away, when Julius Caesar passes away, and this battle, right. can you give us an idea of what's happening at that time? How is the empire struggling why does it come to a head 10 years later? If you can share a little bit of that sure. tension and sure. it started introducing some of that information warfare that I know you yeah. read about. Yeah, so the Roman Empire, the Roman Republic in its last century um, uh, was often dominated by rival armies uh, led by uh, ambitious commanders. And in Rome, there was never room for two at the top. Um, so you, there's always going to be someone who came out on the top. Um, there's the famous rivalry between Marius and Sulla. And then there's the famous rivalry between Caesar and Pompey. And finally, there's the rivalry between Antony and Octavian. It would have been surprising if the two of them had found a way to agree. Still, they tried for a while. Um, remarkably, for a while, Antony was married to Octavian's sister, a woman named Octavia. And uh, certainly there was affection between the two of them. Octavia had two children uh, by Antony. She had two daughters by Antony. Um, and um, they, had their, they, they had their moments, but it was a political marriage. Uh, it was a marriage like a mafia, a marriage between two mafia families. Uh, that was meant to be an alliance to bring the families together to stop the civil war that almost took place long before Actium from happening. And for a while, it was successful. The problem was that they never really trusted each other. Octavia uh, tried to be a good wife, but she never forgot that she was Octavian's sister. And she never forgot her, her loyalty or her responsibilities to her birth family. And she mediated a, a near uh, war between the two men. But uh, strangely enough, when the dust settled, it was Octavian who came out on top. He got the better of the deal uh, than uh, Antony, uh, far the better of, uh, of the deal. And so you have to suspect that Octavia uh, was looking out for her brother's interests and not always for her, for her husband's interests. The, the two sides came to near blows uh, again and again and again. Uh, but they always found ways to stop while each took care of business. In the East, Antony's ambition was to win a war against the Parthian Empire, probably not to conquer the whole thing. That was too much for, uh, for anyone, any one person, too much for any one person to bite off. However, he wanted to conquer part of it. And he fails. You know, he's, he has this great campaign that he puts together uh, and he fails. Meanwhile, in the West, Antony, Octavian has his own problems. First, he has a war uh, over settling veterans. In Rome in this period, veterans were given land. And uh, up to this point, they only got land in Italy. The problem was there wasn't any vacant land in Italy. You had to kick someone else off their land to give it to the veterans. And in this case, the people who were being kicked off revolted. Um, and so there was a war that Octavian had to, had to win. On top of that, he had a naval war on 
his hands uh, because the unfinished business of the civil wars that had racked Rome for a long period at this point uh, allowed the son, the surviving son of Pompey, Caesar's enemy, uh, to build up a naval kingdom. He had his uh, own fleet based in Sicily, and he used it to control Sicily, Corsica, Sardinia, and to raid the Italian coast and from time to time to close off Rome, the grain supply from North Africa and Sicily to Rome. Octavian made, and Antony made a deal with this guy, with Sextus Pompey, but Octavian never trusted him. Uh, and Octavian uh, wanted to defeat him once and for all. So he had his hands full with that. So the, the two sides were busy. Why, if they had avoided war several times, why did this time, why did it fail? Why did that kind of stalemate break? Was there an advantage for one side to move at this point yes. in time? Yes, the advantage was Octavian's. So the war comes only after two things have happened. One, Octavian defeats Sextus Pompey. He finally uh, de defeats Sextus Pompey once and for all, and Sextus Pompey has to flee for his life and eventually is assassinated in the East. Two, Antony is defeated in his uh, attempt to uh, uh, defeat the Parthians. So he is weaker And three, Antony starts to rebuild his strength with the help of Cleopatra, who's the richest uh, ruler in the ancient world. He builds up a new army and he and Cleopatra put together a fleet, uh, which is the, the largest and the strongest fleet uh, in the Mediterranean. Octavian feels that this is the moment. This is the time. You know, there's a window now to make war on uh, Antony, uh, Antony before it's too late. The other thing that happens is, well, as I said, both Octavian and Antony uh, were fighting an information war over who is the legitimate heir of Julius Caesar. Octavian has the name. So when Caesar dies, he leaves a will that says, I posthumously adopt my great nephew, uh, Gaius Octavius. He will take my name and be Gaius Julius Caesar. That's illegal according to Roman law, but Octavian says, I don't care. I'm going to take this. And he becomes Gaius Julius Caesar. Antony is married or at least having a long-term relationship with Cleopatra. And her son is the birth, probably the birth son of Caesar, Caesarian. And in the year before the Battle of Actium, or two years before the Battle of Actium, um, Antony recognizes Caesarian as Caesar's son. Uh, this is an information challenge to Octavian to say, you're not really Caesar. I've got the real Caesar here in Egypt. So that's another reason why Octavian's uh, eager to fight. How, how are they um, kind of enabling information warfare across this large span? Yeah, so information warfare is a really important part of what's going on. Uh, and they get their message out through speeches, through pamphlets, and through coins and statues. Each of these sides mm. is putting out coins. Uh, and the coins aren't any old thing. The coins have messages. For instance, Antony puts out coins with his face on one side and Cleopatra's face on the other side. Uh, and Cleopatra is shown as if she were a Greek or Roman lady. In Egypt, Cleopatra represents herself as if she were a pharaoh. Uh, she looks like uh, somebody who you'd see in the pyramids. Um, they also have point, put out coins illustrating the fact that Cleopatra claims to be the representative of the goddess Isis on earth. And Isis is a very important and popular deity in antiquity. And finally, they put out coins illustrating uh, the number of legions that Antony has. They have coins for each of the different legions and the number of warships uh, that Antony and Cleopatra have as well. Um, and Antony and Cleopatra proclaim to the Eastern part of the Roman empire that they are a god and goddess fighting together. Antony, Cleopatra is Isis or Aphrodite, otherwise known as Venus. Antony depicts himself as Osiris, the Egyptian god, and sometimes as Dionysus, who we know is the god of wine, but he's also the god of liberation and a god of conquest. Meanwhile, in the West, Octavian uh, takes, says, uh, has his Julius Caesar deified, and he gives himself the name Son of a God. His name is not just uh, Octavian, but his name is Julius Caesar, the Son of a God. And he wants people to call him Son of a God. On top of that, when he declares war, on, how does he declare war on Antony? 
First of all, he goes to the Vestal Virgins in Rome and he illegally takes Antony's will, which has been kept there for safekeeping. And he claims that the will gives away the store to Cleopatra. It's giving away part of the Roman Empire to Cleopatra and recognizing Caesarian Ka as Caesar's son and saying that Antony, wherever he dies, he wants to be buried in the East with Cleopatra, not in Rome like a good Roman. And Antony has, has children, including sons, by Roman wives, earlier wives. Antony got around. And um, so it's a slander to say that he doesn't care about Rome. In addition, uh, Octavian has the Senate declare war, but not against Antony. It's not going to be good propaganda to go, uh, to go declare war against Antony because Antony is a fellow Roman, and that would be a civil war. And Caesar has sworn he will never fight a civil war again, having defeated Sextus Pompey. What does he do? He declares war on Cleopatra. This is outrageous. Cleopatra is a loyal ally of Rome. She's done nothing against Rome. Uh, but Antony declares war on her. It would be as if we were to declare war on Canada or something like that. I mean, or maybe Russia and Ukraine to some degree. If, to some degree, if yes. If you want to take. To yeah. some degree, yes. Yes, right. indeed. Fair enough. Um, just as we build up to this battle, there's another question that we, we yeah. addressed last time we spoke, Barry, which is, can right. we trust the history books here? No. And you do a great job of laying out <laughs> some of what, what you base your book on, which is, I mean, there's a, there's a lot here. So how yeah. how do we trust what's going on in this story? Well, you know, um, the, the message I try to give my students all the time uh, is don't trust the sources. Don't trust anything. Always uh, interrogate what you're reading and see where they're coming from. What's their angle? What is it all about? It's especially important in the case of Actium, because basically what we've got is Victor's history. We've got this, the official story as written by um, Octavian, who later becomes Rome's first emperor, the Emperor Augustus. So he's a pretty powerful guy in what he's got. Nonetheless, we can read between the lines. There are a few tidbits that survive from Antony, and we've got terrific um, material evidence. We've got all these coins that Antony and Cleopatra put out. Uh, we've got statues they put up. Um, that both of them did. Um, and we even have some texts. We have part of a, an apocalyptic document that was written at the time, an oracle, a prophecy uh, saying that Rome is the whore that will be destroyed. Its hair will be cut off by the woman who will avenge the East. That's Cleopatra. So we have some sense, some sense uh, of the other side of the story, but we really have to dig. We have to read between the lines and interrogate our sources. Okay, perfect. So now as we start digging into what is this significant naval battle, I think yeah. it's important that we recognize one other individual here, and this is Admiral Agrippa. Yes. And if you can share more about how he comes in, into play for, for this battle, but also yeah. like what led up to this for his career. He's a very decorated naval officer, it sounds like, yeah. even by the time of this, this battle we're about to talk about. Yeah, he's, Agrippa is an unsung, unsung hero, and he is the most decorated naval officer in Roman history. Uh, he was a boyhood friend of, uh, of Octavian, uh, a, a loyal supporter. Uh, he, unlike Octavian, he was a superb general, a great field commander, um, and like Octavian, somebody with a grip of strategy. Um, he had served in Gaul and Germany, where he'd done a very good job of pacifying the region, defending the frontier. Then Octavian called him back to Italy. And uh, his greatest claim to fame in Italy was that he won the naval war against Sextus Pompey. And to do that, he had to build a fleet. Octavian didn't have a competitive fleet to use against Sextus. And to build this fleet, he first uh, had his engineers construct an artificial harbor outside of Naples, on the Bay of Naples. Um, there's, the archaeologists can still find traces of it. Uh, and is the area that became the home port of the Roman imperial fleet. Uh, he, I, he's in no position to win a naval battle by the skill and maneuver, the skill, the maneuverability of his ships or the skill of his helmsmen. He just doesn't have that tradition. So he knows he's going to win battles by the hard way, by boarding the enemy ships. And in order to do that successfully, 
he develops a harpoon that can be shot out from his ships and shot into the enemy ships and drag them uh, close to them and send his men over. Um, the Romans had done something like this before, though not quite as elegantly, uh, and it's very successful. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight, and there are a lot of losses along the way, but ultimately the Romans defeat, uh, they defeat uh, Sextus Pompey in Sicily in, in, in two great naval battles. Uh, as part of these battles, Agrippa also has to uh, master the art of amphibious landings, which is a tough thing to do, and also the art of depriving his enemy of his, uh, of his resources, of his supplies. In a way, uh, Agrippa's way of war is a way of making war on his enemy's strategy and not just on his enemy's, uh, on his enemy's ships. So I think he's referred to as Admiral Agrippa, and you just yes. described in Gaul and Germany. Were those land battles? That those he was were leading? land battles. Those were land battles. Was that common for, for officers it's, at that time? It's not unusual. It's not unusual at all to both be a land uh, combatant and a, and a naval one, um, but not many people excel at both in the way that Agrippa did. Although certainly his greatest moments come at sea. His greatest moments come in naval battles. Okay, so let's let's dig into this naval battle. Yeah, if you can give us a, a tale of both sides. Um, how many ships, and then um, I, I'd love to get into what you kind of alluded to this—the harpoon. Yeah, like a little bit of the strategy that goes along with naval warfare at that sure. time. Sure, sure. So you know, if we just do a tale of the tape, then Antony and Cleopatra should have won. They start out this war with a larger fleet. They've got 500 warships and um, their ships are state of the art. Uh, they've used technology to build warships that have reinforced prows. That means that if the battle is going to come down to ramming ship on ship, they have an advantage. Uh, they've also got, while most of their ships are so-called fives, uh, they're rowed by five men to a room. So on each side, you've got probably got we're not 100% sure how these ships work, but reasonable reconstruction is three men on two on one oar and then two men on another uh, below it. These are big ships. They've got a small number of bigger ships, six and eights and tens. And those ships can be used to break into a fortified enemy port. So they have the capacity not just to... Uh, outnumber the anyone sea and have an advantage at ramming, but they can also attack uh, fortified cities, uh, which means they have the capacity on paper at any rate of invading Italy. Uh, they've also got much, much more money. As I said, Cleopatra is sitting on the wealthiest uh, treasury in the Mediterranean world. Octavian has a smaller fleet, but not such a small fleet. It's 400 ships. He doesn't have a big treasury. He has to raise taxes to huge popular opposition in order to finance his fleet. And navies are expensive in antiquity as they are today. But the one thing he's got is experience. Agrippa has uh, a, a fought, in, fight, fought in a number of naval battles and he's really got a lot of experience. Also, as it turns out, so this, Antony and Cleopatra decide correctly, I think, to take the war to the enemy. And they go to Western Greece in the autumn of the year 32. The, their fleet musters at Ephesus on the uh, Western coast of Turkey near modern Izmir. Uh, and uh, they go to Northwestern Greece. But then what are they going to do? It's kind of late in the campaigning season. They could begin the spring campaigning season by um, uh, sailing across the Adriatic or the Ionian Sea uh, and uh, invading southern Italy. Not an easy thing to do, but possible. But they don't do that. They're waiting for the enemy to come to them instead. But they are not paying attention to good discipline and order. And their fleet is spread out both along the, the western coast of Greece, all the way to the southern tip of the Peloponnesus, but also it's defending uh, points on uh, the Greek mainland and island chain going back to Egypt. Why? It's because they can't feed their, sh their men with the resources of Greece. Greece is a poor country. It just doesn't have the food. They have to ship the food in from the east, mostly from Egypt, which is a grain-rich country. Some of it's coming from Syria 
as well. So they have a long and vulnerable supply chain. Okay. And then there's, as you described the harpoon, if we talk more tactically about this, how I think a lot of us, myself included, as we think about naval battles, it's a standoff with shots, um, obviously with cannons, which we don't have at the time. So right. um, clearly trying to close the gap, as you described with the harpoon, makes sense. Were there other tools that they used to to levy some damage on an opposing yes. force? Yeah, uh, they had catapults. They had catapults, which on the ship. So these are big ships and they're you know heavy enough to have uh, catapults. Um, and uh, they, as they get closer to each other, uh, they can shoot arrows and they can even throw javelins. And they're going to be armed men, about 100 armed men on the deck of each of these ships. Some of them, they have portable towers that they can erect on the ships uh, and men can uh, shoot from the towers as well. And in this particular battle, they use fire arrows also. Um, they're important uh, late in the, in the final stage of the battle. Still, when all is said and done, ramming is a very important part of uh, the naval tactics in this period, either ramming or coming up close to the enemy ship and sh shipping your oars and then shearing off the oars on one side of the enemy ship and thereby uh, making it founder. Okay. Actually, I was going to read just a paragraph that I found really interesting for those who are tactically inclined, and you kind of just touched on all of these aspects, but it's interesting. It says... The most significant differences between the two fleets at Actium lay in the number, manpower, and construction. Ant Anthony's ships had an advantage in proud of proud uh, ramming, which was the preferred way for navies to be in battle. Um, this also deterred the enemy from engaging in a similar maneuver. Instead of ramming the enemy's prow, Octavian and Agrippa's captains would attempt to get through or around Anthony's ships and ram them from the side or attack from behind. They might also engage in more elegant and difficult maneuvering to shear off the enemy's oars on one side, which would cripple it. Um, in addition to ramming, both sides came up close to the enemy's ship to attempt to board and fight on deck. As they neared each other, the two fleets would be shooting bolts and stones from catapults and slings, as well as at a closer range, arrows and javelins. So I just, uh, for people who listen to this, I think they really enjoy hearing like, what was it like to be in one of those environments? And it sounds pretty harrowing if you're on one of those ships having to close that gap and it have was, that fight. It was really harrowing. Uh, I mean, imagine being a rower below deck and, um, and it's also very, very noisy, immensely noisy. I can tell you that just rowing in an eight is very noisy. And there's a reason why in the old movies, you see the coxswain with a megaphone. Um, nowadays in, in eights, people use, um, use microphones and there's a, there's a sound system on the ship, but. Barry, is the, the number word. related to the number of oars? Is that the. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's the number of oars. And so the largest one we're talking about is a 10. Is that what I heard you say? Uh, yes. Uh, but it's not 10 oars on the ship. It would be 10. Uh, uh, well, yeah. The number of, uh, the, the, that number. So an eight is actually, it's the number of oars men or the number of rowers, okay. pardon the number of oars, excuse me. It's the number yep. of rowers. Got it. And I think, as you mentioned, the different size ships, if you could share with us, I believe you describe how at one point they have to burn some of their ships. before yeah. they can. So can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things that Agrippa does is he, he well, the main thing he does is he cuts off Antony and Cleopatra's supplies in a very successful campaign of six months or so before the battle of Actium. So that, in the end, they are forced to fight a breakout battle. They, they're looking for opportunities, and if at all possible, they would try to win the battle by ramming the enemy, but they realize that they're probably just going to have to break out and save whatever number of ships they, they possibly can. And the reason for that is that they don't have any food. I mean, uh, they have a limited amount of food. Their supplies are very limited. Um, their men are deserting and they're also suffering from disease. Um, so uh, they've really allowed themselves to be maneuvered into a terrible position. And so they end up having to burn some of their larger, or they, they decide not to burn their large ships, right? Even though that may have been the tactical um, or, or the strategic play. Yeah. I mean, they don't burn, they burn a lot of their ships. So um, we don't know how many ships they had at Actium, but let us say they have 500 ships, but they need some of them to guard the um, supply routes. 
let's say, and they lose some. So let's say they have 400 ships left at Actium, but there are only 230 that go into the battle. Um, and um, although from the point of view of the battle, those large ships wouldn't have been useful, they keep some of them. Um, there are different theories why. One theory is that Antony still in his heart of heart hoped that he could come back and attack Southern Italy. Uh, another theory is that he was hoping to draw off the enemy to attack those large ships, um, which uh, draw off numbers of the enemy ships to attack some of his large ships so that he would be able to do more damage to other of the enemy ships that would be better able to escape. Yeah. Um, so with this context in mind, can you kind of talk through how this battle evolves? And it, is it truly, it's just in one day, September 2nd? This, yeah. this takes place. Yeah. And was this the largest sea battle we had seen at that time? This many ships? It's not the largest, but it's okay. one of the largest. Right. It's one of the largest. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it takes place on, on one day, a morning and an afternoon. That's September 2nd of 31 BC. Ancient battles are typically one day affair. Sieges can last a long time, uh, but battles are decided in uh, a day, are usually decided in a day. And, um, you know, I don't want to go through all the details, but let's just say that uh, Antony and Cleopatra had hoped, uh, hoped against hope that they'd be able to ram the enemy's fleet, but Agrippa was much too wily uh, to allow them to do that. He kept his distance. He was about a mile away. Uh, he wanted to surround uh, the enemy ships using his greater numbers to envelop them. Um, and by the time that Antony ships uh, reach the enemies, they're out of gas. He doesn't have enough men and his men aren't strong enough to be able to, to engage in a successful or devastating uh, knockout blow to, uh, to the enemy's fleet. Uh, so then they go to plan B, which in a sense, I'd say in some ways, it, Maybe it was plan A and a half, uh, which was to escape. Why do I say that? Because usually in ancient battles, you left your masts and sails on the shore. You wanted your ships to be light for combat. They had their masts and sails on their ships because they knew all along they were probably going to have to escape. So why do they want their masts and sails? Because they want to be able to take advantage of the wind. They know that the wind blows up from the north in the afternoon. They need a north wind to be able to escape uh, because they're heading southward. And they time their attack for uh, unlong sure. The north wind hasn't blown up enough. The wind is sufficiently, sufficiently calm that they can row out and attack the enemy to the west. But after that fails, the wind is coming from the northwest and they, they put their sails up and they turn around and they escape. Octavian ships don't have their sails with them. They don't have their masts with them and they're not in a position to, uh, to follow the enemy ships. But only a portion of Antony and Cleopatra's ships escape the battles. They lose most of them. Most of them are, are still there. Um, at, the, at the end of that day, how, um, I guess, do we see Anthony moving out of there? Like uh, Octavian is is present, Agrippa's there, or, yeah. or is this kind of being fought by just who's left behind, some of the lower ranking folks? Yeah, so it's very controversial what Anthony does. And some people would say that uh, he basically betrays his, uh, his code of honor as a Roman soldier. As a Roman, he should have stayed with his troops, but instead, his men, instead he leaves them. Um, and most of the ships that escape are from Cleopatra's squadron, the Egyptian Navy. If he had to defend himself, he might have said that he'd done this because he wanted to live to fight again another day to defend his cause, which he saw as the cause of the Republic. But, you know, he would have lost a lot of points with the Romans for what he did. How, how devastating is that immediately after? Like, is that just, that is the end of their, the East's ability to move West? Is it recognized as that, or is there still some lingering fighting that takes place? Well, you know, Antony and Cleopatra haven't given up entirely. Um, they're at a huge disadvantage, but they still have some resources. Uh, they talk about moving westward to Spain, setting up a base there. They even talk about fleeing to India, 
Um, but before they can do that, Cleopatra's enemies burn her ships. At that point, you know, Octavian comes east and Cleopatra decides to save herself and she, she gives up Antony at a certain point. Um, Antony's still trying to fight at the end, but his men turn on him and the, they, they, go, they, defect to, they defect to Octavian. If, if they had won, if the East had won, what does Rome look like after yeah. that? How does so that, that change the world that we know today? It changes the world a lot. So what we call the Roman Empire was always really the Greco-Roman Empire. It was a partnership of many peoples, but especially a partnership of the Romans and the Greeks. Uh, the Romans provided the military might and a lot of the administrative and engineering skill, but the Greeks were the cultural powerhouse of the world. And also the, the East, which was largely Greek, was also um, the economic, most dynamic ec economically part of the of the ancient world. Eventually what happens is the, uh, the balance of power shifts eastward and uh, the Romans create a new city, Constantinople, uh, which becomes the capital. And the Romans adopt a new religion, which comes from the East, Christianity, uh, which becomes the Roman religion. And that takes place about three, three and a half centuries after the Battle of Actium. Um, it would have happened all the earlier. If Antony and Cleopatra had won at Actium, Alexandria would have been the second capital of the Roman Empire. Uh, and the Roman Empire would have been much more of a Greek empire much earlier than it eventually became a Greek empire. So it would have sped up history. Um, Western Europe, after all, the Romans hadn't conquered Britain yet. They hadn't even tried to conquer Germany. Um, Western Europe might have been less Romanized uh, than it eventually became. And, and we today might be speaking a language that was partly Greek rather than partly Latin. So it would, could be a very different world. Wow, how interesting. Um, I know you've written several books, Barry. With this uh -huh. one in particular, what are two or three of the things that surprised you as you were researching this or that, that came out from it? Um, I think one of the things that surprised me uh, was how difficult it was to do an amphibious landing in the ancient world and just how audacious um, and success and talent, skillful uh, Agrippa was in this landing far behind enemy lines, cutting off uh, Antony and Cleopatra's main base and supply base in Southwestern Greece. I was also surprised by um, really how, uh, the degree to which Antony, uh, to which Octavian and Agrippa were the underdogs. You know, the way the story is usually told, they were the ones who were destined to win. But in fact, they didn't have, they were far behind in money. They lacked a lot of political support. There's a lot of opposition to them in Italy. Uh, and they had a smaller navy. So it really took a lot of skill and a lot of willing to take risks for them to win the way they did. Uh, I was also surprised by the real skill at which they uh, conducted the campaign once they landed in Greece and kind of the failure of, of Antony and Cleopatra. In that sense, it does remind me of the Russian campaign in Ukraine, at least where we are now in the third week of the war, uh, where I think we've all been surprised at uh, what a paper tiger the Russian army has yeah. turned out to be. Yeah. Is, is the, um, the miscalculation by Antony and Cleopatra, is it that they just overextended their naval forces at a time where uh, these strategists on the other side of Grippa and Octavian were able to kind of cut off their supply lines and bleed them out for a while before attacking. Like maybe, maybe the question is, could Anthony and Cleopatra maybe have won this if they had fought at a time and place of their choosing? Yeah. I mean, I think they could have, uh, but as you know, strategic advantage is everything. And, you know, this is a, I think that, Sun Tzu would have really approved of Agrippa and Octavian and the way they set up this campaign so that the enemy almost fell into their lap when it came time for the climactic battle. It's a totally Sun Tzuian uh, way to run a war. Uh, if Antony, I think Antony and Cleopatra, if they had sh shown the audacity to invade Italy, I think things might have ended differently. And even, even if they'd stayed in Greece, um, if uh, they had had more discipline, if they'd been more ready for the enemy, um, if they didn't allow the enemy to, to dig in, uh, I think they could have won. I think they had the resources to win. 
but they uh, they allowed the enemy to uh, get them into a war of attrition uh, and a war that was going to be dis- in which the advantage would go to the side that had more experience in naval battle. So um, that would necessarily accrue to Agrippa. Makes total sense. Jeez. So this book is coming out in a couple of weeks. I know you're making the rounds. Um, sounds like March 22nd is March the day 22nd. people can get their hands yeah. on Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I will say it's a very interesting read. I mean, you, you're digging into people that we've all heard the names of and, and really like bringing them to life, which is interesting. I will say, I'm sure a lot of people ask this, Hey, we're like the character that we see in the movie gladiator. Is he part of this? Mm-hmm. And my understanding is that's a couple hundred fifty <laughs> years later, right? This yeah. Is totally Russell Crowe, Russell Crowe. So yeah, Gladi- the story of gladiator and the emperor Commodus, uh, that's about 200 years later. 200 okay. years after this. So just setting the stage for people, but this really brings Cleopatra, Mark Anthony, Octavian to life. And it's really interesting to see this military figure, Agrippa, and what he does throughout this, um, throughout these years, but basically in this huge naval battle. So Indeed. thanks so much, Barry, for bringing this to us and uh, giving us some more time to sit down and chat with you. Thank you, Ryan. It's my pleasure. Our listener comment comes from XVSJ on YouTube, and it's in relation to the Ferrat part one story. And it says, crazy story. I'm grateful for you documenting these experiences. My father went to his grave, never sharing this experience with us. We respected his World War II and Korean military service 13 years as a soldier in the 82nd Airborne, and five of his seven brothers served. One gold star brother, in fact. My best to this soldier and his family for his service, sacrifice, and courage. And of course, for um, for those who haven't heard the Farad interview, this is someone who truly just left their home in Europe and went and fought ISIS in Syria. And I think we're about to have several new stories that sound just like this for people who are leaving their homes and going to fight in Ukraine, um, including Aiden, who we interviewed before, who had also traveled to uh, Syria as well. So thank you uh, for sharing this comment. Um, That's quite a family history with World War II, Korea, five brothers serving. Um, That's amazing. Appreciate you taking the time to share that and listen to these great stories. And I'm glad they resonate with you as much as they do with me. Stay safe, everyone.